This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect a new executive, commonly known as GPEX. Now, on GPEX, there are a range of people who hold distinct portfolios and roles, and the body as a whole is responsible for the day-to-day -day management and overseeing the financial and reputational well-being of the Green Party. Bright Green is going to be interviewing as many of the candidates for these elections as possible, and we have the first of our candidates with us today. But before I introduce them, I just have one thing to ask you, which is that you scroll down right now and you hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you a penny, um, but it means that you won't miss out on any of the future videos we're putting out, including the ones we're putting out for this election, the interviews with all the candidates, but also the other videos we're putting out in the coming weeks and months. So without further ado, I will introduce our candidates for today. So I'm delighted to be joined by Matthew Hull, who is standing for the Trade Union Liaison Officer position. Matthew, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little sleepy, but, um, but we'll get through it. Um, so we'll dive straight in. And um, hopefully a relatively straightforward one to kick us off with is I wondered if you could tell our viewers what your experience of working with trade unions is. Of course. Um, so I've been involved in the trade union movement um, for pretty much uh, the whole of my working life. Um, I'm currently 26, um, but in the past few years, I have been a workplace rep um, as a Unite member in one of my workplaces. Um, I've been a union member ever since, and I'm still a member of Unite and the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain, the IWGB. Uh, in addition to that, um, I have been chair of the Green Party Trade Union Group for the past one and a half years or so, and I've also served as the Trade Union Liaison Officer for the London Green Party as well. During that time, I've also been quite heavily involved in a number of trade union and related campaigns. Uh, I've been a member of the volunteer coordinating group of Free Our Unions, which is a campaign um, against the anti-union and anti-strike laws and for a positive bill of trade union rights and freedoms. So over the past few years, I've developed quite a lot of experience working within and between different trade unions, and especially as that relates to the Green Party, which uh, naturally, I think, sets me up really well for this role. So these elections are happening for this particular post of trade union liaison officer at a time of um, significant increases in trade union activity, specifically when it comes to industrial disputes and when it comes to strike action. So obviously the one that many people will be aware of is the, uh, the wave of RMT strikes, um, the three day strike we saw a few weeks ago and the potential for upcoming strikes. But also you have um, CWU members um, having uh, balloted and voted for strike action. There are lots of other ballots going on at the moment. We have a potential um, uh, wave of strike action coming in in July, in August, in September, and on into the winter. Um, how do you think that Greens should be showing practical solidarity and can show practical solidarity with uh, those trade unions and the action they're taking? So I think you've touched on something really useful, Chris, which is that we are at a really important moment. And while I would always say that this role, the trade union liaison work is really important, um, it has perhaps never been quite as important as it is right now. And I think um, the moment is here um, and we need to make sure that that moment doesn't pass and that we don't miss it up. Um, while we are seeing something of an upsurge in terms of sort of, you know, grassroots trade union activity, and we're also seeing trade union leaderships, and especially in the RMT, the CWU, and other strike ready trade unions, um, we need to make sure that that sort of like wave of activity continues to build, um, because these things are difficult to maintain, they do take work, and we are relying on the workers in those sectors um, to sort of build confidence and be prepared to walk out. And for me, I think that's where parties like the Green Party and um, you know, people across the country come in. And that's why it's so important that we do show practical solidarity in a whole number of different ways and make sure that um, workers feel um, confident and able to continue to build um, this sort of wave of action that we're seeing. So um, your question was, you know, sort of what should this look like? And I think it can take a whole manner of different forms. Um, but I think we've already started to do some of work, some of that work, and I think that's great. Um, so during the RNT um, days of strike action that you mentioned um, last month, um, I was really proud to be part of the trade union group team that produced 
um, a resource and campaign pack um, to show how local green parties um, could get out and support the RMT uh, members taking action in their area. I think we can build on that kind of work by producing more resources and more advice for local green parties so that they can take those and run with it in their local area. Ultimately, I think this is something that uh, Greens across the country are going to have to take ownership of themselves. And I'm not going to pretend that any trade union liaison officer sitting on GPEX can do that work for anyone. What I do think is that someone who has experience and a track record of helping Greens to support striking workers, I think having someone like that in the position, someone like me, in other words, um, would really help Greens across the country to sort of, you know, take the ball and run with it. Um, to go and stand on picket lines to help raise awareness um, along, among local residents and green voters of why we need to be supporting more trade union action and more strike action at the moment. And also by helping to raise money for uh, dispute funds, um, strike funds, that kind of thing, anything that can help this wave to continue to build um, into the future. So outside of this kind of particular and specific moment that we're currently in, um, where you have this, uh, yeah, as we've kind of touched on this, um, this increasing militancy from from the trade union movement. What do you see the relationship? What do you, what do you want to see the relationship uh, between the trade unions and the Green Party being? That's a really good question. Um, I think that this is, to an extent, an open question. Um, it's very clear to me that I want that relationship to be much closer and much more durable and long lasting. Um, and I think it's really important that first the Green Party and, and Greens in different areas of the country establish ourselves as credible and sort of reliable supporters of trade unions, of trade union action, and especially of trade union rights, because we can see that the Tories are gearing up uh, to restrict our, our rights to take strike action uh, even further in the near future. I can see the relationship taking any number of different forms, but if I'm totally honest, I think it's most important that um, we take those first steps to build practical solidarity um, with um, workers across the country and with trade unions in particular. Um, I think that this is something that we will have to work out with trade unions um, in the coming months and years. Um, and when I look at um, what's been happening in the Labour Party with various trade unions sort of reconsidering their historic relationship with Labour, um, I see a trade union movement that is discovering that it needs to have its own independent voice, um, its own independent political voice, and that it can't just rely on Labour bureaucrats um, to provide that for them. So what I want to see the Green Party doing is helping um, the trade union movement, and especially those members of the trade union movement um, who see things the way that we do, who support a Green New Deal, who support um, a reduced um, working week to give people more, more freedom, more leisure time. I want to see us amplifying the voices of those people within the trade union movement um, and helping them to find their own voice. And I think that that will um, accrue benefits to the Green Party as well um, in the end. And I think that's the direction that I want to see us taking. Um, the exact form that I want that to take, you know, in sort of institutional terms, like how does the Green Party relate to this or that trade union? I don't want to sort of... Um, sort of make any grand declaration on that because I don't think it's for me or for anyone else um, to sort of do that right now. I think we need to start by doing the work, becoming credible um, allies and supporters of the movement and everything else good will follow from there. So one of the things that um, I think uh, has been a sort of gap in the Green Party's uh, relationship with trade unions is that if you look at other parties on the left, um, they do a lot of work organising within trade unions to shift policy, to uh, get people elected to, um, to to positions as workplace reps, as you know, re on regional committees, on national committees, and indeed up to kind of um, general secretary, assistant general secretary kind of level. The Greens have never really been uh, in that game of, you know, actively organising within the trade union movement to uh, steer the politics of those organisations themselves. Do you think this is a kind of direction that Greens should be moving towards in terms of proactively organising within individual trade unions um, to, uh, to to steer their politics and to, uh, to yeah, build relationships within the institutions like that? 
Um, so, I mean, the short answer to your question is, is yes, um, but I think I should probably give you a bit more to go on. Um, so you're, you're quite right, I think, um, for, for many Greens, although not all, um, for many Greens, this has not been a natural thing for us to do. Um, we don't have quite the same tradition as other parties, um, even much smaller sort of political parties on the left. We don't have the same tradition of working closely within trade union structures, um, both to sort of help to strengthen them, but also to advance, you know, our sort of broad political programme, whatever that happens to be. Uh, now, I've already talked a bit about what I want to see Greens doing to support trade unions as Green Party members, you know, what should local Green Parties be doing, what should councillors be doing, that kind of thing. But I think you've touched on a, a, another really important side of things, which is getting Greens to sort of work proactively through trade unions. Um, and I think in this regard, we do already, we're, we're starting from a position of some strength, because I know, for example, as chair of the Green Party trade union group, that we do have some small concentrations of members in certain trade unions. We know, for example, that we have lots of members in the UCU, the Universities and Colleges Union. We know that we have lots of members in the National Education Union, the NEU, which is the largest teaching union by far, and which is also uh, very likely to be balloting its members um, for strike action of some sort in the coming sort of six to eight months. And so I think we are starting from a position of strength in certain sectors uh, of the workforce and certain areas of the economy. And so my plan uh, as trade union liaison officer is to take those areas where we have some strength, where we have those sort of nuclei of, um, of, of active and, and active trade union members and start to sort of bring them together into groups. Ultimately, I think this is something which depends on bringing together a small group of organisers within each trade union so that they can deliberate on and determine where they want this to go. So just to give you an example, you know, I want to bring together teachers and education workers um, in the Green Party. I want to identify them and map where they are. And then I want to bring them together so that they can decide how they want to work within their union, not only um, to help sort of shape policy uh, in the near future so they might want to put more of an emphasis on green education policies like our opposition to academization, for example, um, or our opposition to sort of teaching to the test and other things that we oppose in, in education. But they might also want to think about how they can help to build positivity um, around ballots for industrial action um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and ultimately, I want to be led by um, the people who work in these sectors, who know them best. Um, and I think the first step in that is firstly to sort of map where these members are, like who are they, um, which trade unions and which sectors of the economy do we already have these sort of little nuclei, um, these, these groups in, and then bringing them together so that they can work out a plan and, and helping them every step of the way. Um, that's uh, what I've been sort of starting with the trade union group, and it's what I want to continue um, with the added uh, influence and sort of um, like authority that the position of trade union liaison officer um, would give me. And I think that's why I really want to be elected to, to GPEX this time and, and why I need people's vote. Now, you set out, I think, a kind of comprehensive uh, vision of what you want to do with the role there. And um, also your kind of understanding and kind of thoughts on what the relationship between Greens and trade unions should be. Now, there'll be some people who'll be watching who will be thinking, well, that sounds great, but is it the priority for Greens to be to be doing this work? And uh, I think there's, there's there's kind of two arguments that people can make here. The first is that um, that all sounds lovely and nice and important that, you know, uh, people are working more with trade unions and so on. But the, the priority of the Green Party is to get Greens elected into local government, international government. Um, and we don't necessarily need to be wasting our time uh, doing this kind of <clears throat> work with external bodies. And I think there's a second argument that people will make as well, which is that if you look at the history of Green politics, um, the the Green Party of England Wales and other Green Parties across the, the world, their politics was forged in the social movements of the 1960s. And uh, historically, Greens have um, been uh, embedded in social movements for climate justice, for environmental justice, for peace, for, um, for social justice and so on. 
And you mentioned earlier the word tradition, and you talked about how Greens don't have the same tradition as other left parties of working within the Labour movement. And some people would say, well, that's because our politics was formed in very different circumstances, and it was formed uh, with those relationships with social movements rather than the Labour movement. So what would you say to someone who was uh, watching this who would say, well, that all sounds well and good, but surely the priority in terms of our wider strategy is to strengthen relationships with the kind of wider social movement ecology um, of the climate movement, of the peace movement and so on, rather than focusing on the labour movement. Um, I think, that, firstly, I think those are really good and really searching questions, and I'm glad you've asked them. Um, I'll try and take them in turn. I might ask you to sort of remind me um, if I get lost along the way. Um, but yeah, the, the first sort of part of that question was, you know, why shouldn't we be focusing on sort of getting Greens elected um, instead of um, all of this work that you're proposing, Matthew, um, is sort of what I'm, what I'm hearing. And I suppose my first answer to that is that I don't see it as an either or question, right? I think the two things should and will go hand in hand if we do them right. Um, I like to sort of refer to examples that I've, I've been involved in. So, um, uh, for example, um, in my role as trade union liaison officer in London, one of the things I'm most proud of um, is working with Hackney Green Party to support them and to build um, their work with local trade unions and local workers into their electoral and other campaigns work. Um, so in Hackney, in Dalston in particular, which was the sort of target ward, um, there's a, a really high concentration of, of uh, restaurants and takeaways serving the local community. And so there's also a really high concentration of couriers and delivery riders um, serving those, those outlets. Um, and the delivery riders in those outlets were, you know, having a really bad time of it in so many different ways. We all know about how um, so many people in these areas are um, sort of underpaid and overworked and, and really precarious in their work as well. Um, but also the space that the local council wasn't making available to those workers. Couriers need to be able to park somewhere, they need to be able to meet up with each other and talk somewhere, and they need to be able to wait while they're waiting to collect orders to go and deliver them. And these are all things that Hackney Council was making really hard for these drivers and wasn't um, providing to them. And so uh, the target councillors in, in, in Dalston, um, one of whom you know, got elected, Zoe Garbutt, um, sort of really took this and run, ran with it and made this part of their campaigning. Uh, they spoke to residents about this and um, it ended up in their campaign literature. And I think it was really powerful and they got great feedback um, on this kind of work. So that's just a small example of how I think we can bring these, these various different things together and how I think um, the one side of things, the electoral side can strengthen our work with trade unions and workers and vice versa. Um, but I think the, the other thing that I'd, I'd say to this question, you know, about whether it's sort of getting Greens elected or working with trade unions is that ultimately, I think if we are going to achieve what we want to achieve, like we need to build a certain level of consciousness among people. We need people to be thinking about who is on their side and how we're going to achieve and then sort of defend the progress that we want to make in society, whether it's on the environment, on social justice, on economic justice as well. And ultimately between elections in the sort of, you know, the, the years that many people in this country go without thinking about how they're gonna vote, we do need institutions, I think, that bring people together, that help them to see that their interests lie in working with fellow working people and not in um, you know, allegiance with the Tories or with their boss um, or with the people who you know, own and operate most of the British media. And I think trade unions are really good at that. They're good at bringing people together and concentrating um, on the things that we have in common as working people but between elections at times when people aren't always thinking about politics when they have to be thinking about their pay packet or how much they've had to work this week concentrating people on the fact that you know those are issues they have in common um, with their colleagues and with their co-workers and with other working people and also focusing on the idea that those problems are caused by their bosses by the Tories by um, the billionaire owned media all of these things are I think really politically important in building the coalition that will then go and vote green and vote for radical options at the next election and so that's why I don't think that we can draw this sort of like neat distinction between the two things I think they're both sort of a fundamental part of how we should be um, fighting, how we should be winning elections in the future. Um, 
I'm just going to get onto the sort of second half of your question now. Sorry, I've been talking for a while. Um, but this was about traditions. And, and you're right, I did refer to the Greens not having a tradition of working within, um, within trade union structures in the past. And perhaps I should have said, instead of tradition, I should have said we don't have a habit of doing that. Um, because I do think that there are really, really bold and inspiring traditions we can find in our own history. Um, so not uh, the sort of term green in a political sense is quite contested, but one of its origins is in the Green Bands movement um, in New South Wales, in Australia, where um, uh, the, the Builders Labourers Confederation, a sort of a, a union bringing together a Builders Labourers, led by um, Jack Mundy, a Australian Communist Party member who later became a founding member of the Australian Greens, um, led a movement to refuse to develop areas of, of their city um, that would um, ostracize or push out working people. So, you know, they would collectively refuse to build or develop an area if they thought the development was going to be harmful to the working class of, of the city, you know, in general. Um, and this was highly successful until it was crushed by the Australian state, which I think correctly identified that, that this movement was a threat to, well, to the, the Australian capitalist state and to the developers who were trying to monopolise um, building. And so I do think there are positive traditions, trade union traditions that we can reach for. Um, the other thing that I would say um, in terms of sort of building relationships with other social movements as well, I do think that that's absolutely critical and I have no desire whatsoever to draw away from that. The one thing I would say as well is that a lot of those social movements that you refer to are now beginning to train their sites on the labour movement. So I think we increasingly see among Extinction Rebellion, for example, a focus on the labour question, on where trade unions, where workers, and especially where workers in fossil fuel intensive industries come into their activism. We saw the founding of XR Trade Unionists, the group, um, a couple of months ago. Um, we've seen uh, more, and a, more and more of a focus uh, on workers and the role that they will play in a just transition um, from groups like Platform, like Green New Deal UK, and um, its successor organisation. So um, I really do think that this is the direction things are going in. And if we do want to keep up with our social movement roots, then we do also need to be turning towards the labour movement in quite the same way. Um, I hope that sort of begins to answer those, th those two questions that you asked. Absolutely, yeah. And you've led me really nicely onto what I wanted to ask you next, which was um, you mentioned there about the, uh, the role of, of workers in carbon intensive industries. Now, um, there's there are some in uh, the kind of climate movement and uh, indeed in the Green Party who would say, um, you know, you look at some of the trade unions we have in the UK and their kind of approaches and policies and stances on, you know, certain industries. Um, I'm thinking, for example, about trade unions like Unite, which have historically supported the expansion of Heathrow Airport or GMB, which have um, historically supported um, fracking. And they would and, and people, uh, a lot of people in the climate movement have historically said, look, we are running out of time to deal with the climate crisis. We don't have time for Unite and GMB and, GMB and others to catch up. Um, what would you say to those people? So, I mean, I've got a lot to say to those people. And I have a first, the first thing I want to say is that I have a lot of, um, you know, at first glance, I have a lot of sympathy with that perspective because I can see how people get to that situation, you know, where, where we're seeing things like that. We really do need to, you know, like the best time to act on the climate crisis was decades ago. Like the second best time is, is, is right now. Um, we've got no time to lose. And it is um, really damaging, I think, that a lot of people, and especially a lot of um, sort of bureaucrats and, and paid officials in the trade union movement, do, um, you know, jam the gears of, of, of progress in, in many regards. Um, so I have, you know, some sympathy with that. What I would say um, is firstly, that I think the, not only the cooperation, but the sort of active involvement and participation of the labor movement, and especially the labor movement rank and file, in green politics and in the just transition that we want to see come about is absolutely indispensable. I think we need to be very clear about this. Um, there are some people in society who will benefit from a green policy program, the stuff that we want to do. We want to fundamentally and irreversibly shift wealth and power in this country towards um, you know, the many and, not the, and away from the few who currently hold it. And it's very clear to me 
that the people who currently control the commanding heights of, of industry, um, you know, for their own personal profit, won't support us in that, in much the same way that landlords, private landlords, won't be supporting us when we want to implement strict rent controls for the benefit of renters. There are, however, groups of people who will benefit from the stuff that we want to do. And, and for me, that's pretty clearly the mass of working people sort of broadly defined, you know, who will be more free, better paid and with more spare time to use as they and their households wish um, in the future should we win. So it's pretty clear to me, like what the sort of potential and, and hopefully like very concrete green um, sort of social coalition is. It's clear who is going to support us. Um, and it's clearly not the bosses and it clearly is the workers. And um, so that brings us to the question of what we do about um, the workers institutions when, you know, the ones that we've inherited um, don't seem to be sort of working the way that we would want them to or seeing things quite the way that we want them to. We've sort of covered one of one of the answers to this question, which is to get organized within the trade unions. And I think that's exactly why many of the social movements that I've mentioned in my, my last answer are starting to take this really seriously, are starting to work really seriously through trade union structures um, because they know that it's absolutely indispensable work. The other thing that I would say is that in as much as it's going to be you know, hard work to turn the GMB and unite around, um, this is also, you know, there sort of is no alternative. No, we can't build an equivalent labor movement from scratch in less than five years. These are institutions we've had to build up, build up through decades and decades of really hard and painstaking work. Um, and so in a sense, I think we have to work through what we have. Um, the other thing I, I, I would sort of finally emphasize is that we are more likely um, to get the active and active support and participation of GMB, of Unite, of other large unions uh, with members in uh, carbon intensive industries on our side if they feel powerful, if they feel like they are in a strong position to bargain through a transition and make sure that it serves their members and the wider working class. Trade unions have traditionally been most conservative on environmental and social justice questions when they feel threatened when they are coming off the back of historic defeats. Now, um, a lot of people, I'm sure, I'm gonna make a pop culture reference here, a lot of people will have been um, watching Sherwood on the BBC and they will have been um, seeing, you know, perhaps from close up or like perhaps the first time, they'll have seen a dramatic um, sort of depiction of, of the impact that um, the destruction of a carbon intensive industry um, has had on a community um, that lost faith in the political system overall. Now, it's no surprise to me that people in communities like that have a sort of, have a learned skepticism of politicians who arrive with grand designs, promising that while they're gonna lose everything they have right now, they're gonna get something better in the future. Now, I think the way to make people think more positively and be more forward looking, the way to win the support of workers who are currently working in carbon intensive and climate destroying industries is to hand them the power over their lives. It's to make them confident that they have the power to bargain and demand for something better. And I think that way, a transformation of their working conditions and what and the in very industry they work in starts to look more like a positive thing that they want rather than something that's being imposed on them from miles and miles away in Westminster. And so I think that's a sort of brief encapsulation of why I think the only way through this, this knotty problem is worker empowerment and to empower workers within those unions to sweep away the people who are holding them back and to feel more confident. And I think that's the way that we're gonna get their support for the green program that we want to see. That's a brilliant moment to end our conversation about the trade union aspect of uh, this election. Now, um, because you're standing for election for uh, the Green Party Executive, GPEX, um, you won't just be doing, uh, if you were elected, you won't just be doing the work of um, organizing the trade union movement as you kind of talked about. You'll also be a member of um, the executive as a whole. So you'll be making a whole host of decisions um, on that body in relation to the financial direction of the party, the, um, the general um, you know, issues around staffing, around resourcing, around strategy, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that are kind of slightly broader and about the, the party as a whole. So what right now do you think is the biggest challenge facing the Green Party? Wow, that's a really big question. Um, I think for me, um, one of the biggest challenges um, that we're facing um, is to sort of look at our, our internal structures and to make sure that they, they serve everyone in the party. 
Um, at the moment, I think it's been clear that um, the various structures that we have um, in decision making and also in disciplinary matters um, aren't doing their job in keeping people safe, in making sure people feel able to be play an active role um, in the Green Party. And I think um, that getting that sorted is absolutely fundamental to making sure that we can get on with the rest of the work that we're meant to be doing, the kind of stuff that we've just talked about um, for the last half an hour or so, Chris. Um, in addition to that, I think um, we have a whole lot of work to do to um, answer what has been thrown up by the Diverse Matters um, report that's recently been handed to the party. Um, and I think that raises a lot of questions about how we can start to rectify the sort of lack of, of diversity and the lack of representation that the report identified um, in the Green Party membership, but also in, in various Green Party structures. Um, and I think that raises a lot of political questions as well. You know, I think um, there's a lot that we'll have to sort of think about in how we deal with those things. Um, but those are sort of two of the main things that I think party needs to uh, tackle head on um, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. This next actually led on to the, the second question I wanted to ask you around wider GPEC stuff, which is that um, there are a range of kind of um, issues relating to discrimination and diversity within the party that have been recurring issues over the last few years. Um, it's, uh, quite, um, it's quite clear that the, the Green Party has a, a whiteness problem um, and is a very, uh, it's dominated uh, in terms of its um, elected representatives, in terms of uh, people within positions of seniority in the party um, by, by white people. Um, but also one of the other big issues that we, um, that that has been in you know is, is, is something that is, which is infecting society as a whole right now kind of whipped up by the right-wing press and the tories um but has also been an issue um a significant issue within the green party which is the issue around transphobia and um i wanted to kind of to ask you you know um gpex will be as you say looking at the the, the issues around the the diverse matters report that's just been published but also wider issues of discrimination what's going to be your approach if you are elected to tackling those issues in the party again i think that's a, a really a really important question a really big one um i hope my answer um does justice but i do encourage uh, members of the party who are watching this um if they have any further questions to to get in touch with me um, you can usually find me on Twitter, um, is probably the easiest way. Um, in terms of my approach, um, I think um, with regards to the sort of first half of that question, um, the sort of, you know, well, as you put it, the sort of overwhelming sort of whiteness of, of the party. Um, I think in terms of addressing that, one of the most important things we can do is hand the power um, to um, the people of colour uh, within the party who are already doing so much great work and to try and sort of like steer the party, um, to try and make it a, a not only a welcoming, but also really empowering um, place for, for people of colour in general um, to be and to organise. Um, in general, I think it's, it is best to, to be led by, um, by people of colour on these questions and especially, um, you know, people of colour who are really passionate about achieving all of the, all of the green sort of aims and objectives um, that they join the party to achieve. Um, that would be my first step on that question. Um, I do think there are then going to be political questions to answer about sort of what this means for sort of where we campaign, how we campaign, for how we communicate green policy ideas, um, and for sort of, you know, like how to sort of make sure that this doesn't just get lost um, in, in this, this week or month and this does get taken forward and that we do hold, hold ourselves accountable to this. Um, in terms of the question around transphobia, um, again, I guess there is so much um, there is so much to be said on this, um, and so I do encourage members to to get in touch with me if they want to hear more of what I think on this. Um, in broad terms, what I'll say um, is that there is no place for transphobia um, within the Green Party, in my view. Um, I think it's really important that um, those um, those within the party who persistently organize um, around transphobic talking points and who persistently smear members of the LGBT community um, who propagate um, untruths um, about members of the LGBT community and truths that often put people in harm's way. Um, those people, I think, um, need to be subject to 
to disciplinary reaction. I think that's totally fair. And that's and one of the failings of the party so far is that it hasn't done that um, to a halfway adequate extent. Um, I think there's a broader um, there's a broader question about how we sort of deal with this this in the longer term. Um, I think that it's really important that we also address the sort of political dimensions of this issue. Um, so that in addition to the sort of you know what I see as the sort of main organisers of transphobia, uh, transphobia within the Green Party, I think there are also people who who feel a bit sort of like broadly sort of lost in these questions. And I think um, for those people, we need to develop a way of delivering, you know, political education that encourages people to think deeply about where transphobia comes from, why it's so politically damaging, the role that it plays in the broader political economy, you know, the reason why the Conservatives uh, and Viktor Orban in Hungary and the GOP, the Republican Party in the US are also obsessively focused on it. I think building a greater and deeper understanding of the role that transphobia is playing um, in right-wing reaction in the current moment would, I think, help more and more Greens to understand why it's so important that we, that we oppose it wholeheartedly. And so in addition to the sort of disciplinary aspect of this question, which is important, I also think it's absolutely critical that we address its political dimensions, address the political roots of transphobia. Um, and, and I think that will be a sort of more, more, more lasting and, and ultimately more positive solution because it will help us to, to move on and, you know, I, I, I guess sort of like preempt the problem to a greater extent in future. I've got one last serious question for you before I move on to, to a flippant one before we wrap up. Um, so we've talked about various bits and pieces throughout this, this kind of conversation. Um, and I think we've we've touched upon this at various points, but um, obviously with um, you know this election being to GPEX and the role that GPEX has um, within the party as one of the two main governance bodies, um, and it's uh, you know the, the steering the, the Green Party's focus on elections and its kind of political strategy, um, which is obviously led by the other governance body, the Green Party Regional Council, but GPEX has uh, a role in feeding into that. Um, one of the big questions the party's been sort of grappling with for the last 12 years is how on earth do we get uh, a second MP? Um, and also, I think a question which um, has been, I think, is going to become increasingly uh, pertinent for the Greens is how do we move from a position of um, getting incremental gains in local elections where, you know, we get from one councillor to three councillors to five councillors, to the point where um, we're in a position where we're running uh, chunks of the state across the country um, in local government and ideally later in national government too. Um, what do you think the what do you think is the social coalition that we need to pull together as a party in order to achieve that? Yeah, so I mean, you're right that I've sort of touched on the question of the social coalition that we want to see um, already. Um, so I, I said earlier that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty clear that um, a Green Party policy programme is what's absolutely needed both to save the earth and to preserve it for the people and the other beings who, who live on it. Um, there's no question of that. I think it's also, um, I think, indisputably true that the Green Party policy programme and our green values um, pose a substantial threat to the small number of people who currently hold the vast proportion of, of wealth and power in this country. Um, the people who profit from uh, unpaid labor that, that unpaid carers do, that people do in the home, um, the people who profit from the exploitation of people when they are at work, who profit from wage theft, who profit from the precarity that those food delivery careers that I mentioned experience when they're working. The people who profit from all of these things will not support us when we um, set out to end all of these forms of exploitation. I think that is unquestionable. Now, there is also no question that they will want to, at some point, if we get big enough and scary enough to them, try and sort of co-opt our energies and try and make sure that, you know, we can be managed. Um, but I think if we want to achieve our objectives of saving people and planet, of overcoming um, capitalist exploitation of, of both the environment and ecological resources, but also, you know, the people who live here, then I think there is no question that, that those people won't support us. I think the people who will be more likely to support us are those who will benefit from that transformation. And I think that the proportion of people who will benefit from that transformation um, is many times larger 
than the number of people who who will not benefit. Um, I think the vast majority of, people's, uh, of the people in this country stand to gain from a Green Party policy programme being implemented. And I think we should be reaching out to them uh, you know, consistently and helping them to see that their interests lie with each other and not in allegiance with their bosses, with the capitalist state, with our billionaire owned, owned media. And broadly speaking, yeah, I think our social coalition consists of um, the working class, um, perhaps the sort of lower, you know, the lower reaches of the professional class, you know, the criminal barristers who've been striking over poverty pay over the past couple of weeks, particularly young people who are beginning to realise that the, the promise of sort of home ownership and sort of steady investment um, and a gold-plated pension um, that their parents enjoyed are not going to be made available to them, who are realising that the promises um, of Thatcherism and its children um, are, are, are totally empty and will not serve them. I think all of these people can be bound together um, in a social coalition that will support um, a Green Party policy programme. And that's where I want to be looking for, um, for the Green Party support. Um, I think that's going to be the base of it. Um, and yeah, so that's my sort of broad answer. I, I hope that sort of gets to what you were looking for. That's perfect. Um, so I promised I'd finish on a flippant question and I will deliver. Uh, so who in the Green Party inspires you the most? I'm not sure that I'm not sure that feels terribly flippant. I feel like I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I don't know maybe I'll make someone's day and, and maybe I'll sort of like insult a whole bunch of other people. Um, it's yeah it's a really good question. There are lots of people who are I suppose responsible for me both like getting involved in and then I guess staying in the Green Party as well, um, you know, for, for the past several years. Um, a big one, um, I'm going to say, is uh, Sam Coates, who was a county councillor in Oxfordshire and was in Oxford when I went there to study, um, and who was sort of always a presence in local Green Party meetings when I got involved. Um, Sam's been really important for sort of influencing my political development since then. Um, I still, you know, really rely on his sort of advice and, and support for many things. So, um, so yeah, um, shout out to Sam. I hope this isn't too cringy, but but yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say Sam. Sam has been a, a real inspiration. Uh, I'm sure Sam will be very happy with that. And um, for folks who don't know Sam Coates, I would really recommend checking out a video series that the Young Greens put out. Um, which is a series of lectures that Sam did essentially charting the, the kind of history of neoliberalism and the social movements, the labour movement and how they can challenge it and how as Greens we can come together with the various different uh, social forces to um, dismantle um, sort of 40 years of factorism. Um, so on that note, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Um, but before we do, Matthew, is there anything you want to plug in terms of where people can find out more about your campaign? Um, yeah, of course. So uh, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at MJ underscore Hull. So at MJ underscore H-U-L-L. And if you search Matthew Hull in Twitter, you'll also find me there. Uh, I also have a Facebook page, which is Matthew Hull for Trade Union Liaison Officer. Um, please find me there as well. Um, and yeah, if you do have any other questions and you, you want to ask me in a sort of more private forum, I guess, um, I also have an email address, which is uh, H-U-L-L-5418 at live.co.uk. Um, that's Hull5418 at live.co.uk. I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. And yeah, please, uh, please vote for me. I hope I've given you adequate reason over the past 45 minutes. Thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you to everyone who has been watching. I just have a few final things to say before we let you go. The first of them, I said at the beginning, I'm going to say it again now, uh, please do scroll down and hit that subscribe button. Uh, we're hoping to interview all the candidates in these elections, um, or as many as we can. Um, you won't miss any of the interviews we're putting out with them if you hit that subscribe button. Um, it doesn't cost you a penny, so please go ahead and do it now. Uh, the second thing is that obviously we've had a quite a lengthy discussion. There'll be lots of things in there that you agree with, lots of things in there I'm sure that you disagree with. Um, whatever you thought about the interview, let us know in the comments down below uh, and start the conversation there. Um, now, you may be surprised to hear that Bright Green doesn't have the backing of billionaires or big business. We rely exclusively on the kind and generous donations of people like you. So if you've enjoyed this interview, 
If you appreciate uh, the role it plays in the Green Party's elections, if you want to see more interviews like this, then please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation that keeps everything running. And finally, throughout the elections, we'll be running news pieces, comment pieces, analysis of everything that's going on, not just in the executive elections, but also in the deputy leadership election that's happening concurrently. So please do go to bright-green.org to find all our coverage of these elections and more. So that's all for today. That's all from me. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon.